Hi, I'm Jeff Davis of the Friends of Sonoma County Y Library, here with today's visual oral history with founder and owner, David Stair of Dry Creek Vineyard. David, thanks for joining me today. You're welcome, it's nice to be here. Yeah. You know, uh, you've, con you've been considered a pioneer and your older story, your beginnings, parallel those of the pioneers who came west over a century ago. Uh, you used to work for the railroad, you were following a dream, you even had uh, a shovel, pitchfork, and possibly a pickaxe in your hand at one time during that time period, but um, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, okay. but backing up a little, you graduated from MIT, Right. very impressive, and you did work for the B&O Railroad. Yeah, I, I got my bachelor's degree from MIT in civil engineering and then got an MBA from Northwestern University, wow. majoring in transportation marketing. Huh? And my first love in life has always been railroads. And so I had summer jobs with the Pennsylvania Railroad back, in the, back east. And after graduate school, I went to work for the B&O for about four years. Not as a train engineer, but as an industrial engineer. Right, and did you do some marketing as well? You said yes, you yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Um, you took some trips to the Loire Valley in France, and there was something about the Sancerre or the Puy Fume that really grabbed your attention yeah, and, and inspired and you to get into the wine district. In the summer of 1970, my wife and I spent two weeks in France in Burgundy and Bordeaux and the Loire Valley, and I came up with a scatterbrained idea that what I really wanted to do for the rest of my life was somehow move back to France and get into the wine business. Well, fortunately for me and for France, an article appeared in the Wall Street Journal just after that trip talking about what a great future California had for becoming a premium mm. grape growing and wine producing area. And mm -hmm. as a result of that article, I forgot about France and turned my eyes towards California. But there was something about that Sauvignon Blanc that really captured you, huh? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, it's, it's always been one of my favorite wines, yeah. Mm -hmm. Then you, you had the confidence to know that you could move to California and start your own wine? Well, it was probably the nuts. That was crazy. <laughs> Uh, so you did move to California. The first place you went was, appropriately, UC Davis. Yeah, I moved out here. The, it's, when I, it's funny. In March of 1971, I took a three or four day course at Davis on the wine business and realized that what I needed to do was go back to school full time and learn something more about it. So my family and I moved out here in August of 71. Kim was about six. My daughter Kim was about six or and seven. And you fully retired from B&O? Yeah, I retired. Or left? Yeah. And my younger daughter was about nine months old. And we came out and I spent a year at UC Davis as a special graduate student studying enology and viticulture. Right. And while at Davis, spent most of my free time over here in Sonoma, a little bit in Napa and Mendocino and the other traditional wine growing areas of Northern California. But pretty soon in this wandering around the wine country, it became evident that what I wanted to do would be best done in Northern Sonoma County. Mm -hmm. Because Northern Sonoma County had a history of grape growing going back well over 100 years, right. and was pretty much an undiscovered area at the time. It mm. was, it was uh, there were very few wineries trying to produce premium and quality wines here, and it just seemed like this is the place to locate. So in 1972, you broke ground here uh, on, on this spot. Yes. And there's a, a moment in time captured on your website in a photo with Kim with shovel in hand, yeah. throwing some dirt. And you're standing there with either a glass of wine or a glass of champagne. I'm not sure what it was, I don't recall. <laughs> we basically uh, broke ground, it's, let me back up. In 1972, uh, I bought this property, in basically in April of 72. I bought about oh, 70 acres here in Dry Creek Valley and wanted to build the winery up at my house. Uh, and unfortunately, the neighbors got up in arms about having a winery built on West Dry Creek Road. That was my next question. The opposition was led by Jerry Lambert, who ultimately started Lambert Bridge Winery. But he went around and got a couple hundred signatures from the neighbors. I went around and got a couple hundred signatures from the neighbors. And I think probably the people signed both petitions. The Board of Zoning Adjustments approved our use permit uh, 5-0 in their hearing. And then they, my neighbors appealed it to the Board of Supervisors. And about two days before the hearing before the board, I got a call from Hank Spomer, who used to be our supervisor in the 4th District here, mm -hmm. in, which is where Dry Creek Valley is located. And Hank said, Dave, you've caused quite a ruckus in Dry Creek Valley. Can you come in and see me? So I drove down to Santa Rosa, and I saw him, and he said, Dave, you know, you've created quite a stir up there, and we're going to turn you down. 
Wow. We're going to reverse the BZA's uh, uh, ruling. But he said, you do own the property at the corner of Lambert Bridge and Dry Creek Road. Uh, yes, sir, I do. He said, well, we're going to make you put the winery there. And believe me, that's a lot better place to build a winery than West Dry Creek Road. And in retrospect, I'm so glad my neighbors protested me huh. because this is the prime location in Dry Creek Valley. Right. And it's, it's, it would have been much more difficult over on, on West Dry Creek Road. Hmm. So it's an interesting turn of events. And another reason you were a pioneer because you were the first one to plant Sauvignon Blanc in this area, even though some vineyard specialists said that probably yeah, wouldn't I, be a good when idea. I, after I bought this property, sometime in the spring or summer of 72, I don't exactly recall when, I got Bob Sessions, who used to be the Sonoma County Farm Advisor, dealing in grapes. Uh, Dale Good, who used to be probably one of the leading viticulturists in the area, uh, and a backhoe out here, and we dug some holes, <coughs> excuse me, over across the creek in what's known as DCB3. And Bob and, and I jumped down in the hole, and they looked around, yep, looks like pretty good vineyard dirt. It's, it'll be a good vineyard. I said, what varieties would you recommend growing here? Here, and I, they said, uh, Napa Gamay and Chardonnay. Hmm. And I said, what about Sauvignon Blanc? And they both said, no, nah, it's a bad variety. You don't, you don't want to grow Sauvignon Blanc here. As it turned out, it's by far, I think, the best white variety from Dry Creek Valley. Right, yeah. Um, another first you had was the first winery to open since Prohibition. And it was, that was a 39-year span, which indicates the, the, uh, the impact that Prohibition we were, had on the wine industry. I used to think we were the first new winery in northern Sonoma County since Prohibition. And about a month ago, I was at a meeting of the Dry Creek Valley Association, and uh, one of my former neighbors, I now live in Santa Rosa, came up to me and said, Dave, you know, my husband and I started a winery in the late 30s. It went out of business 30 years ago, but we were the first new winery. Then I said, well, we're the first winery since Prohibition, it still is in business. Right, right. Okay, then we'll go ahead and leave that in. Okay, yeah. We'll have to cut that out. Why did you choose to call uh, the Sauvignon Blanc Fumé Blanc? Well, I remember having a lunch with Barney Fetzer, who started Fetzer mm -hmm. Winery back in the late 60s, mm -hmm. sometime in 72 or 3, and we were chatting, and I said, Barney, why do you call your uh, Sauvignon Blanc Fumé Blanc and not Sauvignon Blanc? And he said, because it sells. And he told me a story that one day they were bottling Sauvignon Blanc, and what was bottled before lunch was labeled Fumé Blanc. What was bottled after lunch was labeled Sauvignon Blanc. Same, same tank of wine, same wine. And he said the Sauvignon Blanc, I mean the Fumé Blanc outsold the Sauvignon Blanc three to one on the shelf. Wow. So I figured, well, hey, I'm in the wine sales business, so let's call it Fumé Blanc. Huh. Was uh, Sauvignon Blanc just not that familiar at the it time? It was, well, Robert Mondavi came up with the name Sauvignon Blanc, I mean, Fumé Blanc in 1968. Right. And his Fumé Blanc took off like a, a wildfire. Hmm. And it, at that time, all the top selling Sauvignon Blancs were labeled Fumé Blanc. Ours own, Interesting. I think Beringer, Chateau Saint Jean, Mondavi. Uh, I think now the trend is more back towards. Uh, Sauvignon Blanc than Fumé Blanc. But. Sure, yeah, you don't really see too much Fumé Blanc, but you're still using it. Yes, though, yeah. yeah. Wonder, it's still our best-selling wine. I wonder if it's just a confusion with Cabernet Sauvignon and they just weren't getting the Sauvignon well, Blanc. Well, I think, you know, traditionally, uh, we've never really barrel-aged our, our Sauvignon Blanc. Uh, it, it basically stays in stainless steel mm -hmm. and it bottled, bottled right after fermentation, usually by February or March following harvest. Uh, and sees no oak whatsoever. Uh, the Australians call a oak-aged Sauvignon Blanc Fumé Blanc, mm -hmm. but ours is not oak-aged, and I'm not sure what the other wineries do now. If I'm not mistaken, uh, Fumé means like smoke. It means basically white smoke. It's yeah. French words for white smoke. So it kind of makes sense. Uh, a barrel does give it that kind of a smoky, oaky yeah, it does, uh, but... flavor to it. So, huh. What other varieties were you growing at that time? Uh, our initial vineyards were planted to Chenin Ch uh, Blanc, Sauvignon Blanc, and Cabernet. Mm -hmm. And uh, after a few years of grow making our own Chenin Blanc, it became apparent to me that, you know, you could buy very good Chenin Blanc from Clarksburg. Yeah. Uh, and so we basically t butted over our 
are uh, Chenin Blanc to, to more Sauvignon Blanc. Hmm. And uh, for the last 30 years, all of, our, all of our Chenin Blanc has come from the Clarksburg area. That's south of Sacramento. It's about, about 30 miles south of Sacramento. Now, did I see that you were exporting your Chenin Blanc to the UK? Oh, at one time, about 10% of our production was, was exported. <clears throat> and one time we had our, one of our earlier wholesalers in England uh, really liked our Chenin Blanc and they got a placement with a chain of liquor stores called Threshers. And they bought five or 6,000 cases one year wow. of Chenin Blanc. Hmm. And uh, unfortunately, we no longer have that business, but our Chenin Blanc yeah. sales are still doing very strong. And that was in the early 80s, right? 70s or early 80s, yeah, yeah. I don't recall oh. exactly when. Maybe the early 80s, yeah. I remember seeing a, a label of uh, 1982, I think it was, of your Dry Creek Vineyard Reserve, and your name is prominent on top of the label, David Astaire, estate-grown Dry Creek Reserve. Yeah. So you, you didn't stick with that too long. Well, you? you know, back in the early 80s, I think it was, the BATF came up with the ruling or was considering a ruling that if you had a brand name Dry Creek Valley or Dry Creek Vineyard or Alexander Valley or Sonoma Vineyards, all of the, I think all of the grapes in that bottling had to come from the appellation implied in sure. the name. Right. And uh, that's why we came up with the name David Astaire, because for a while we thought we might have to drop the term Dry Creek Vineyard hmm. and rename the uh. winery. So we, uh, we started, our, I think, our first reserve wines. Uh, were bottled under the David Stair label. And uh, I think we made a, a Chardonnay, a, a Red, and I think Sauv uh, uh, Sauvignon Blanc. Yeah, Blanc. the one I saw was a Merlot Cab yeah. uh, blend. It's interesting, uh, about a month ago, I was at a tasting uh, of, there's a group called the Old Timers in the wine business, and about every three months we get together and have lunch and sure. talk about the good old times. Yeah. And one of the other people at this luncheon about a month ago brought a bottle of David S. Stair Reserve Merlot from 1983. And I must admit, it was a wonderful wine. And he yeah. raved about it, and people who tasted it thought it was wonderful. Great. 30-plus-year-old 30, 30 year old California Merlot. Nice job. And you made that one? It was made here, yeah. yeah. You yourself? I was the winemaker for the first couple of years, and then as we began to grow, it became evident that I couldn't do everything. For the first couple of years, I did everything. Uh -huh. And yeah. our first winemaker was a fellow, John Jaffrey. And John worked for me, I think, from 1976 through 81. And then we hired a fellow, Larry Levine. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and Larry worked for us from 81, I think, through 98. He was here for about 16 or 17 years and did a wonderful job. And, uh, but that wine was probably made by Larry if it was, it was in 83. Mm -hmm. And if I'm not mistaken, that period was when the sailboat appeared on the label for the first yes. time, and it's been there ever, ever we, since. We, our earlier marketing team was, we, I, I helped a friend of mine, a fellow by the name of Dave Reddy. We started a company called Winery Associates, which did, did the wine marketing and sales for Dry Creek, Preston, Alexander Valley Vineyards, Pedron Tully, and William Wheeler Winery. Oh. And, uh, Dave began to perceive that we needed a uh, a some sort of symbol different label than the, than the standard. The original label was kind of a pen and ink drawing of the wine of the original winery building, mm. and we played around in the early to mid '80s with uh, you know half a dozen different labels and didn't like any of them. Then someone said, I think maybe Dave or maybe my daughter Kim said, you know, you've always been interested in sailing. Let's try something with a sailing theme. So I gave this, arc, uh, this artist we had a couple of dozen issues of various sailing magazines, and oh. he came back about a month later with four or five mock-up labels with featuring sailboats, and I said, hey, that's what we want. So we moved to the sailing theme, I'd say in the mid-'80s. And you had been a fan of sailing for a I started long. sailing when I was about nine years old back in New England. I did find it kind of humorous that you have a sailboat. With in a dry creek. Dry creek yeah. valley. <laughs> a dry creek yeah. valley. And then Kim, I understand, was uh, her expertise continued that. Uh, yeah, in Kim. The Kim uh, went to school, uh, went to college at uh, uh, San, San Francisco Houston. State uh, with a degree in home economics, majoring in fashion design. And then she worked for three or four years in the fashion industry, and then realized if she wanted to be a success, she'd have to move to L.A. or New York City, which she didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. So ultimately, she came to work for us as initially as our, 
our San Francisco sales rep mm -hmm. and worked for a couple of years doing that and then gradually became to kind of our director of marketing mm -hmm. and uh, did you always hoped on uh, yeah that I, th would return? I, I think I think every parent would like to have their kids get interested in the family business right. uh, but I think it's a mistake if they force them in it it's got to be their own decision that's what I hear all the time yeah you know and, and fortunately most older wine makers and current ones uh, had the foresight to let them do their own thing. And yeah. I think that helps them return. If you yes, were forcing so. them, they'd be almost forced to leave. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you 100%. Now, if you don't mind me asking this personal question, I've never heard this, but uh, what, uh, what happened with your wife? She, she's not featured, featured much at all in your history. My first wife and I got divorced in 1980. And then I was a bachelor for about 25 years. In about 2004, I met uh, a lady, Lee Stassforth, and we dated for a couple of years, then started living together, and we lived in sin for about six years. We got, we got married in 2012, and we've been happily married for seven and a half years. Oh, great. And she's not involved in the wine business. And that's why you're happily married? Because <laughs> she just stays out of it? I, I don't know if I'd say that. Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, it, it's, I think a lot of people who, it's, it's probably got to be difficult to work with your wife and then, yeah. I don't know. It's easier to work with your daughter, I would imagine. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, um, continuing Kim's story, she ended up becoming the vice president, and this is now president yes, of Dry Creek yeah. Vineyard. And uh, she, along with her husband, Don Wallace, have made quite an impact here, and I'm sure you're quite yes. thrilled about oh, that. The, Kim has done a wonderful job, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, getting back to the sailing theme, uh, you and your winery have really ingrained yourself into the sailing world and even doing some philanthropic endeavors. Yes, you know, sailing has been a passion of mine since I was about nine or ten years old. And, uh, you know, for 30 years I owned a 37-foot sailboat in San Francisco Bay and I sold it about 15 years ago. And I'm originally from New England and we bought a, a small cottage on the coast of Maine about 10 years ago. And now I have a 15-foot sailboat back there, which suffices my sailing fix uh -huh, for the year. Right. Uh, you even have a tab on your website, Wine for Sailors. Yes. Yeah. So you make a particular brand for them, or do you just you no, help them with I, their... No, it's just, you know, it's just... And you partner, though, with certain races. Yeah, we've America's done some Cup work with America's Cup folks. And uh, the year 2000, uh, Kim and I went to New Zealand uh, and did a wine tasting there. Uh, and uh, at the America's Cup Village. Mm, nice. Yeah. You must love combining the two Oh passions. yeah, it's, it's, a very, yeah. it's a lot of fun, yes. Speaking of positive en endeavors, um, you have been sustainably farmed for quite a while now, and Sonoma County has uh, proposed the idea of being 100% sustainable. And that came about in 2014. By this year, 2019, and we're very close at 97%. But uh, you are sustainable here, and uh, you follow that principle yes. quite well. And Don Wallace helps you with that? Yes. Yeah, that's one of his main interests. Congratulations on your support of those endeavors. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Another incredible project you spearheaded is uh, Vineyards to Villages, which you and I have talked about in the past, and uh, in association with Global Partners for Development, you help bring clean water project initiatives to West Kenya, and uh, that has been an incredible challenge and great success yeah, I, I got involved with Global Partners about 12 years ago. Uh, they're a Sonoma County based uh, organization which basically does development projects in Kenya, Tanzania, and Uganda, traditionally the, th the three traditional East African countries. And uh, four or five years ago we were trying to figure out how to involve the wine business and came up with this idea that you know, in order to make good wine and grow good grapes, you've got to have a reliable source of good water and clean water. Mm -hmm. And in order to grow good people, you've got to have the same kind of thing, a good source of water. Mm -hmm. And so many, so many villages in rural uh, East Africa have no reliable source of clean water. Quite often, women and oftentimes children, one of their main duties is to walk a mile or two or three uh, to fetch water for their family mm -hmm. in a five-gallon bucket, bring it back, and that's their supply of water for the day. And out of that, they, they cook and they wash, and, and oftentimes the water comes from polluted sources. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been to Africa several times and hope to go again fairly soon. 
And one of my most vivid memories uh, and one of my trips to Africa was seeing, we were in Western Kenya near the town of Kasumu where we have some projects. And incidentally, President Obama's father is from this area of Kenya. Oh, yeah. But we were visiting one of our projects, uh, looking at a water well that we'd done a couple of years ago and talking with the villagers about it. And along comes walking down this path, an African lady dressed in a very fancy kind of uh, shawl, carrying a bucket of water in her head, talking on her cell phone. <laughs> such, a, such a contradiction of the old right. and the new. But they still didn't really have a great resource for water until you guys came yeah, along. Yeah, and, and you know, one of the problems with, if you have to go a mile or two to get water, uh, it takes a significant part of the day, and oftentimes children, that's part of the jo children's jobs, it prevents them from going to school. Right. And by, by coming up with a better source of water close to home, uh, we, uh, first of all, li eliminate a lot of waterborne diseases because they're drinking good water, and it, it frees up more time for the kids to go to school. So Global Partners' two main efforts are uh, kind of clean water projects, which we call wash, water, and sanitation hygiene, and education, building schools and encouraging the young African women to stay in school and finish high school and go on to college. And my wife and I have personally sponsored three kids over the last few years. Uh, two of them are now teachers. One of them wants to become a lawyer eventually. And uh, Yeah, I remember you telling me that a couple yeah. of years ago. And that's great. And there's a photo on the Global Partners website of you surrounded by all these children yes, from this yeah. community. And that must have just been an incredible feeling. It is. It was very enjoyable, very, yeah. very rewarding. So each year, proceeds from the Vineyard to Villages uh, wine event uh, helps out with this yes. project. And so a number of wineries, quite a few wineries. We have about uh, maybe 15 or so that are actively involved. Gallo is quite heavily involved. Corbell supports us and, mm -hmm. and a lot of smaller wineries. We raise about 100 grand a year, I think, through Avengers to Villages. Yeah, and nice. our goal is to, there's, there's this one county in Western Kenya that 21 schools do not have a clean water source. And our goal is to try to come up with funds to enable each of these schools to have a clean water source. And then it provides a clean water source for the village that surrounds the school. Oh, that's awesome. It is. I'm sure you're proud it's of your accomplishments. It's, it's a very satisfying feeling. Yeah. I asked you earlier, I said, do you hang around the winery much? And you're like, no. Not really. I've, I'm retired. But I've, this I've, is the things that you're doing. Yeah, you're I've gotten retirement. involved in that. I've also gotten very involved. I, it's funny. I, when I was in high school, I played trombone and banjo in the high school marching band. And I, had a little, I played in a little jazz band. That's hard to do at the same time, isn't it? No, well, I, I, I'm working on it. I can't do both at the same time. But uh, when I retired, I was at a Christmas party uh, and uh, a few, eight or nine years ago, and met a fellow, Lou Sobrana, who many Hillsburger people know. He used to be the high school band teacher. And mm -hmm. I said, Lou, what are you doing now? Oh, I run the New Horizons Band of Sonoma County. Nice. What's that? Oh, it's a group of older retired citizens, both men and women, playing music. Do you have any instruments? And I said, well, I have an old banjo and an old trombone. and I haven't, I haven't touched them in 50 years. He said, well, we can't use a banjo, but we can always use another trombone player. So I started going to New Horizons Band, and then about a year later, they started a, a Dixieland combo. Nice. And it needed a banjo player, so I got my old banjo out, and my, my wife got it fixed up, and, and I started playing banjo, and now it's my, my, kind of my main instrument. I play trombone, yeah. but... I play banjo a lot more. and That's a great opportunity. I just got back from spending two days at a banjo seminar in, in uh, Sacramento this past weekend. The banjo used to be the most popular instrument in America. Prior to the advent of radio and recording, if you were a family in the 1870s and wanted to have music at home, you had to play it yourself. Mm -hmm. And mo a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of homes had pianos and a lot of people had banjos. And, Kids used to get together with their mother and dad and play banjo and piano and sing. That's great, yeah. That was home entertainment right. before radio and TV. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the candle would go out and time for bed. Yeah, I, I actually, my, I found the picture, or my sister found it, uh, of for seven or eight people, I think my grandfather is one of them, playing in a string band. There were three or four guitars, a couple of banjo players, and a mandolin player, and I'm sure my grandfather is one of those people. 
Excellent. But the picture's probably from the 1870s or 1880s. Mm -hmm. Anything next on your itinerary, your docket? <laughs> not really. Retirement, your golden years? Uh, not really. No. But you're coming up in three years on your 50th anniversary. I know. Yeah, that's going to be quite a celebration, I bet. Yes, it will be. Any plans yet? Are you working on them? Well, Kim's working on it. It's her, uh, she's working yeah, on it. Yeah. She's going to surprise you with a few things, maybe? I hope Are so. Are you going to perform? Possibly? Possibly. Keep, keep, keep practicing. Possibly. <laughs> Or at least the, I, the jazz band I play in is going to perform, I hope. Right. Well, I'm thrilled to have a chance to get to learn more about you, and you've, you've had some major accomplishments, and uh, you must be proud of that. And it's uh, been fun I, to sit I, here and talk You know, about. I'm very proud. I, you know, I think I'm very proud of my daughter, Kim. Mm -hmm. She's done a wonderful job over the last few years. And, and she wants to keep it in the family. I yes. Understand. So we'll... And they have kids now as well? They have two kids. Uh, my daughter, uh, my granddaughter, Taylor, is, I think is 20 five or six and my grandson Spencer is 21, be 22 this coming uh, August. And uh, so far, neither of them have shown any interest in the wine business. Hmm. Uh, Taylor is into internet marketing, which I suppose you could integrate into the business. Sure. But Spencer is a junior at Montana State, majoring in fishing. Huh. His, his main passion in life is fishing and skiing. And so he, he, he actually had a summer job last summer uh, as a fishing guide at a fancy dude ranch, hmm. as the head fishing guide, and right. I think he likes to. Go, he's going to go to school one semester and then go to and become a fishing guide for one semester. He's on the eight-year plan. Well, maybe uh, he'll get into sailboating, and then that'll bring him back yeah, to Dry Creek Vineyard. Maybe so. Well, David, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you Thank very you again much for your time. You bet. Mm -hmm.